We are glad that you are here with us this morning at First Presbyterian Church. As we're going through just some of the announcements coming up this week, if you would take a second to fill in the pew pad, we would really appreciate that. First of all, if you slept in this morning, you missed a really good breakfast provided by our deacons. Thank you, deacons, for that breakfast. Uh, they did it as sort of a kickoff with the Sunday school, so thank you. Um, also, we have a new member class is being planned. If you are interested, please sign up in Galbraith Hall or call the church office. Um, if you are a current member and you would still like to attend to find out what else is going on here at the church, you are also welcome. Things coming up in November include the Newcastle Light Up Night Parade, which is going to be on Thursday, November 30th. They've moved it back later in the month. We are once again planning to open our church up after the parade uh, for participants to get warm and have hot chocolate and cookies. If you would be willing to provide some cookies, please sign up in Galbraith Hall. Cookies do not have to be homemade, but those are appreciated. Uh, Store-bought cookies are fine, but of course homemade are even better. We would love to have enough. We've had quite a few people participate that in, in past years. Also, thinking ahead, next Sunday is the best Sunday of the year. You get an extra hour of sleep. So please make sure that you set your clocks back one hour before you go to bed. Also remember to change the batteries in your smoke detector and CO2 detectors. Um, but get your extra hour of sleep. You can wide awake for next week's sermon. Otherwise, if you don't, you're going to show up and find nobody here. Also coming up in November, we have on the 19th is the Thanks for Giving Luncheon. Start making plans now to please attend. You'll be hearing more about our stewardship campaign over the next three weeks. And on the 19th is when we will look at what is we are proposing for our budget for 2018. And then we have sort of a luncheon just to thank the congregation for being a part of our activities this year. Thanks for giving of your time, talent, and treasure. So please plan to stay and eat. We will have a great meal. You don't have to bring in anything. Everything will be provided for you. Also, there'll be a sign-up sheet next week. If you've noticed, there's a lot of things that we do in our church. Most of them involve food. Um, that's something we're really good at. Uh, we've gotten really used to having fellowship every Sunday. But instead of having one or two people do it all the time, we'd really like to kind of spread the wealth. So if you'd be willing to bring a snack on a Sunday that we can share, uh, we would love to have you sign up. You do not have to do it all yourself. We can have two or three people do it. That's really what we've had happen when we've had the fellowship out there. So if you would be willing to pick up a bag of Chex Mix or something like that, uh, we'll have that sign-up sheet. We really could use some help in doing that. There is no children's worship today. Uh, Leslie is out of town, so children, after the children's sermon, you'll return and sit with your families. If you would be in Reformation Sunday, uh, if you want to see the great Reformation, see Ed after church today. He has a picture to show you. <laughs> and also, as you notice in the bulletin, uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. If you have not taken the time this month to thank Pastor Rick for all that he has given our church and his wife Patty for their leadership during this time of transition, please make a point to do that today after the worship in Galbraith Hall. And Sandy Earl has a presentation to do. This is really a special day for the Christian Ed Committee. We are going to give at least one of our children their third grade Bible. If Emily and her family would like to come up for the presentation. Thank you. 
Congratulations. Now Chad has a word about the holy cow. have an interactive announcement this morning. I'm up here for the pastor nominating committee. Uh, would everybody who has filled out the survey please stand up? Yeah, thank you very much. We have 26 results. Those of you that haven't filled out the surveys, see some of these folks tell you it takes five minutes of your time and they can tell you it wasn't painful, so please. We're here for everyone that hasn't filled out the surveys yet to please do so. Um, we have two weeks left. Uh, it closes on November 12th, two weeks from today. We really need your input. Uh, we're going to meet with the folks from Holy Cow very shortly after the, um, the results of the surveys are known. We'd love to have 100% participation. Like I said, we have 26 surveys so far, so I'm sure there's 40, 50 more we could, we could get. So please take some time in the next couple weeks to do that. Uh, see me with any questions. We have paper surveys if you need them. Uh, we'll help you do it on the computer, whatever you need to, to get it done. Uh, and then for the nominating committee, if we can meet for two minutes down, down front, we have to set our next meeting. Um, so just come down front after worship for, for two minutes, and I'll make it brief, I promise. And there's uh, one more announcement. Pastor Rick has something. I just want to thank you very much for the appreciation. I forgot there was pastor's appreciation. I don't think about those things. And all of a sudden, I'm getting all kinds of responses. Thank you very, very much and for the flowers and all that. I appreciate you guys. You guys are you're a good congregation. I have enjoyed being with you. And it, we're getting on almost a year now that we've been together. And, and I've enjoyed it very much. So thank you. And if there's one thing I would like you to do, to, if you really appreciate what we're doing, fill out the holy cow survey. <laughs> We really need to do that, folks. That really will be very, very helpful. So please do that if you haven't. So thank you very much. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prayer. if you're able and join me in the call to worship which is printed in your bulletin or projected on the wall the Lord be with you, and also with you. we praise you O oh God for your many blessings because you have incorporated us 
within the extended family of this congregation on this Reformation Sunday. We sing your praises, hear your word, and plant ourselves anew. We therefore invoke your blessing on this our worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Join me in the call to confessions, which is printed in the bulletin and projected on the wall. Who among us is not an outlaw? How often do we jaywalk, exceed, lim exceed speed limits, ooze through stop signs? I think somebody was following me around. <laughs> Fudge on traffic lights, cross the double line, stripe when passing, we also defy the laws of God. From such brazen arrogance, we ask the Lord to deliver us. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another with the unison prayer of confession. O oh God, we who reforms and redeems, you have blessed your church when brave persons protested against corruption and exploitation. We acknowledge that all too often we honor those bold ones of the past and forget our duty to be such protestants in our time. Forgive our sins of insensitivity and cowardice. Help us to be courageous agents of your love. We boldly lift up to you all our personal and private sins that weigh on our souls, seeking forgiveness in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 
Now please lift up your personal confessions. Hear the good news. In the midst of our estrangement, we are received. We can receive our past, celebrate the present, and plan for the future. All because, through the love of God in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Because God has forgiven us, let us show our love for one another by offering the sign of Christ's peace and love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, this week is a fun week. What happens this week? What's coming up this week? Halloween's coming up this week. That's right. Now, do you know why Halloween is Halloween? I mean, why do they call it Halloween? Do anybody know why? Because it's it's the day before All Hallows' Eve. All Hallows' Eve is the night before Halloween. Just like Christmas Eve is the eve before Christmas Day. Well, All Hallows' Eve is before Halloween. Now, All Hallows' Eve is a very special day. It's really the day that we celebrate All Saints. It's a sacred holiday. It's a special, it's a religious holiday. And that's what it, it's, that's how it started out. And we celebrate all the saints. That's what all hallowed means. Hallow means saint. All hallows, all holy week. All hallows week. And we remember all the saints. The saints are people who have gone to heaven. When you make it to heaven, you're really a saint. Now, some people say that some are saints, but everybody that goes to heaven is really a saint. Even if some people say some people are more special than others, everybody's a saint. When you're here on earth, you're a human. When you go to heaven, you're a saint. So it's, we remember the saints. And so we have fun and remembering the saints. That's why we celebrate Halloween. That's part of the deal. Now, how many of you have a pumpkin at house in your house th- these days? You have a, a, a pumpkin? Yeah. What do you do with pumpkins? What can you do with pumpkins? What do you do? Yeah, you can carve them and, 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 make, and make faces. And what else can you do with pumpkins? You can eat pumpkin pie. You can eat pumpkin pie. That's right. What else can you do? Yeah, you, you, you like pumpkin seeds? You like pumpkin seeds? What else? Yeah, you can paint them. Yeah, what else? That's right. You can have... And so, so we're, a lot, we're a lot like pumpkins, actually, when God's eyes. Because if you think about it, if we pretend that we're like pumpkins, God made us... He helped us grow just like you plant pumpkins and you grow into becoming a pumpkin. And then, what, like what we told, we, we, what we do, what we do, we cut out, we take out all the goop. Well, God take it out, took out all the goop and all the sin and all the bad stuff because he sent Jesus. And he, he, he forgave us of our sins and then he puts a happy face on us. Okay? Because of what he's done. Jesus forgives us. And we're, we're happy because Jesus forgives us. And then also, we can have a light 
on the inside. And we, the light of Jesus is inside us. And then we can share that light with everybody. And that's what, so we're kind of like a pumpkin. Jesus came in, God came in, took all the bad, all the gooky stuff, and gave us a happy face and puts a light inside us. So remember, the next time you see a pumpkin, you're kind of like a pumpkin. And you can shine the light of Jesus to everybody you see. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for pumpkins and for all the good times we have at Halloween and for all the times we remember all the saints in heaven. Bless us now as we come to know more about you at church and Sunday school. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time. Jesus loved the little Join me in prayer. Holy God, help us to know your word and not take it for granted. Move us to hear the freshness of your spirit within your word, though they may be familiar. Help us to honor you by paying attention to how you are speaking to each of us today. Teach us to respond to your call so that we may be ever more faithful disciples we come to your word in the name of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jeremiah stood at the gate of one of the temple's courts where he could be hear heard by many. He accused the people of making the temple a fetish. That means something with magical powers. As though their repetition of the word the temple of the Lord, it was a current hymn of the time, carried with it the potency of a protective charm. So let us listen to the word of God from Jeremiah 7, verses 1 through 7, found on page 1027. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye men of Judah, who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, and if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I give, gave of old to your fathers forever. We now turn to the New Testament, and we're turning to Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. This is John the Baptist's message. And in this message, John gives a threat and a promise. And the whole passage is full of vivid pictures. In the eyes of John, the gesture made by these men coming to be baptized was only a sham repentance. True repentance, he says, is recognized by its fruits. So let's listen for the word of God. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. In those days, no, but then when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, 
He said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to, from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. O God, may you bless not only the readings from your word, but also the singing of your word and the playing of your word and now the interpretation of your word so that it all can become your word to us. And then we may hear what you want us to hear, be what you want us to be, and do what you want us to do. Amen. Near the end of October, we Presbyterians celebrate the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. It's a time when we remember and give thanks for apostles like St. Andrew, martyrs like Patrick Hamilton, reformers like John Knox, John Calvin, Martin Luther, and clergy like Francis McKimmy, John Witherspoon, and the 12 Presbyterian elders who signed the Declaration of Independence. Yes, so much of our Presbyterian heritage is wrapped up with our country's independence and religious freedom. Now, as you know, and I think some of you don't know, I'm a Campbell on my mother's side. I'm a Campbell of a Scot. So as I did when we looked at the Scots Confession, which is the black one in the back there by the door, when we looked at the Scots Confession, I'm wearing my Campbell tartan tie in honor of our Scottish heritage as Presbyterians. I'm also wearing, uh, a, this is a Hamilton tartan stole. And as you can, if you can't quite see it back there, you can see the X behind the Celtic cross on the banner. That's, this is the tartan of Patrick Hamilton from the Scottish Reformation. So I'm wearing a Campbell tartan tie and a Hamilton tartan stole. And whenever I wear tartans, from different clans at the same time, I think I'm in deep conflict with myself. <laughs> but that's nothing new. Now we all know what a Scot is, but what is a Protestant? Because that's who we are. And could you explain it to someone who came up and asked, well, what, you're a Protestant, what, are, what, are, what does a Protestant mean? What are Protestants? Well, as you remember, it all started on October 31st, 1517, on All Hallows' Eve. And an obscure monk named Martin Luther hammered 95 debatable propositions to the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. Now, he sought no more than to stimulate discussion around a, a battery of issues that plagued religious practice and Christian theology. Oh. Little did he know. This whole incident started what we call the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, which we celebrate this year, today, on its 500th anniversary. 500 years ago this happened. Now, Martin Luther was the heart of the Reformation. He really was. He was the heart. And then John Calvin became the mind of the Reformation. He wrote it all down. And then one of his pupils, John Knox, who was a Scot, carried it to Scotland. And then that Presbyterian flavor of the Reformation made its way over here to America. Today there are an estimated over 230 million Protestant Christians in the world. Now that 
equals the population of the United States and then some. But we call ourselves by different names, here in America especially. We call ourselves Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Baptists, Congregationalists, Disciples of Christ, Nazarene, Missionary Alliance, Presbyterians, and on we go. In fact, there, here in Lawrence County, there are over 48 different Protestant denominations represented. And that is, in itself can cause problems. It has caused problems just, just because there are so many flavors on the Protestant menu. The story goes that Jesus had returned to the present day and he was meeting with a group of church representatives and Jesus said, folks, I've got an idea. And before he could utter another word, the Baptist said, is it moral? The Episcopalian said, well, is it liturgical? The Methodist said, is it non-alcoholic? The Lutheran says, well, is it sacramental? The Congregationalist said, well, is it inclusive? The Assembly of God person said, is it praiseworthy? The Nazarene said, is it sanctified? The Presbyterian said, is it decent and in order? Jesus said, forget it. <laughs> yes, in some ways, it's too bad there's so many denominations. Or as one little boy put it, to what abomination do you belong? <laughs> yeah, it's fragmented the church of Jesus Christ. But then if you remember your Bible, there was one other time in history when the Lord decided it would be necessary to decentralize. Genesis chapter 11. The Tower of Babel. The people tried to build a tower to heaven for the purpose of their own glory, but not God. God disapproved of this sort of skyscraper kind of ego that tries to put creature above creator. So the people were scattered by way of language barriers. And then, as you remember, that was the Old Testament, but then in the New Testament, during Pentecost, the Holy Spirit tried to rectify that at Pentecost and everybody came together and understood the languages. Well, so too, the tower of medieval Catholicism had grown tall, and archaic and self-serving by the 16th century. But it wasn't all bad during those times. I mean, the centuries between Pentecost and Luther were eras of massive achievement and noble faith. All the great cathedrals of Europe were built, and the church had been a stable cultural influence in the development of civilization. But by the 16th century, corruption was widespread in the church and the Protestant reformers were alert to the needs of the people. The people wanted desperately unobstructed communion with their God. They wanted to be free of the multitude of, of rules and clerical control. They wanted those rituals lifted that obscured the gospel and, and muzzled the scriptures. And the time was ripe for a reformation. And the temperament was naturally building and bubbling up in the soul of the church. And also at that time, that was the time of the Renaissance. So God seemed to, to fling open the, the doors of history and the, and the windows and the light came in and the Reformation happened in the Renaissance. It was a, a magnificent time in history. And I sense, folks, that another Reformation is bubbling up through the church today. Yeah. Luther's bulletin board poster broke it wide open. Now you remember his battle cry was Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, for by grace you've been saved by faith. Now in theological jargon it comes out the priesthood of all believers. You can go directly to God. You don't have to go through a priest or anybody. You have direct access to God. The priesthood of all believers. And the question that Luther kept forcing the church to confront was, can you earn the love of God? Can you bribe the love of God? Can you strong arm the love of God? No. You can't do that. Since we've traveled away now, since the 16th century, does being a Protestant 
mean anything to you today. We are Protestants. Now the word Protestant is not a negative word as some believe. It, it's derived from the Latin protestar. Protestar. To testify on behalf of. I mean, think about it, folks. How could the Protestant church have lasted for 500 years just protesting against something? No, we've been testifying on behalf of something. And Luther said it time and time again, the just shall live by faith. Here I stand. Do you know where you stand? Folks, the health of any church the health of any Christian, the health of any nation depends on assimilating the finest values of the past and making those values and those principles yours. Any group of people with no historical memory are at the mercy of every passing philosophy and fanaticism. A church that ignores its past is in deadly peril. And that's one of the reasons you're taking the survey. We need your the history. We can't ignore the past because if we don't remember the mistakes of the past, we're bound to make them again. So let's not be in danger of forgetting our history. We have a rich history as Christians, as Protestants, as Presbyterians, as First Presbyterian Church in Newcastle. But we Christians can forget who we are because we forget to whom we belong Jesus Christ it gets confusing some of these terms in history in historical language especially with kids when children hear the word Presbyterian if they've never heard it before they think those are the people that have those special crosswalks at intersections yeah. Presbyterian pedestrian and then Calvinists, you know, we've been glad we're not really Calvinist pure anymore, but Calvinists, now Calvinists, aren't those people who wear Calvin Klein jeans? You know, Cal, yeah. it gets all confusing and it's frightening because if we don't remember to whom we belong, then we start substituting our own traditions and we start calling the church ours instead of the Lord's. And then if you really think about it, a lot of activity in the church has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, does it? The Bible is full of warnings about the dangers of dead traditions. That's what Jeremiah did. Jer oh, Jeremiah was good from our Old Testament lesson. Jeremiah, as we read, stood in the doorway as his congregation came to church and he shouted, change the way you're living and the things you're doing. Stop trusting in those deceptive words you think will save you by saying the temple is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. What an usher or greeter he would have made for us. Uh, can you imagine him standing, shouting as you as you came into church? Change the way you're living and the things you're doing. Stop trusting in those deceptive words you think that saying that First Presbyterian Church is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. That's how Jeremiah sounded alert, an alert to a self-satisfied church. Now the people of Israel were accustomed to hearing preachers denounce the abomination of evils, yeah. They were also familiar with baptizing pagans who wanted to identify with the faith of Israel. But what shook them was the appearance of a fiery prophet called the Baptist who reserved his denunciations for his own people and demanded that they undergo baptism as a sign of repentance. I asked John the Baptist is very much in the Protestant tradition. He was the reformer of the first century. And from our New Testament scripture today, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Sounds a lot like Jeremiah. We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, 
the axe is laid to the root of the trees. And every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. The Baptist is saying to us that out of our so-called churches, God will raise up the new Christians he needs. He will raise up new Protestants. He will raise up new Presbyterians. And if you're not ready for that, then you better get out of the way. I think John the Baptist would agree with Lee Iacocca's commercial for Chrysler a number of years ago. You remember that commercial? In this business, you better lead, follow, or get out of the way. Reformation, renewal, repentance. That's what John the Baptist, that's what John Knox, that's what John Calvin, that's what Martin Luther preached. Sometimes we can get so carried away with our own idea of what church is that we need a good reformation. We need a good renewal every so often so we can get back to the church of Jesus Christ. And that's what First Presbyterian Church is all about. That's what it's always been about. And right now, folks, you are going through your own little reformation. This church is going through that right now in this transition time. That's what's happening. And I think we need some more reformed Protestants. People willing to testify, here I stand, for I know who I am because I know to whom I belong. Do you belong to Jesus Christ? A new group came to town and called themselves the True Christian Church. And they canvassed the neighborhoods looking for members, and they came across one old farmer out plowing his field who told them, Yeah, you say you're the True Christian Church? Well, I'll tell you. I was brought up a Presbyterian. I am a Presbyterian. I will continue to be a Presbyterian, and I'm going to die a Presbyterian, and nobody's going to make a true Christian out of me. <laughs> At this time in First Presbyterian Church's history, let's remember who we are, and the only way to do that is to know to whom we belong. Do you know where you stand? Let me sum it up, I think, eloquently from a great pastor's words. Alan Bosak said it so well. He said, We're not called to be fearful. We're called to love. We're not called to be perfect. We're called to be faithful. We're not called to be fearless. We're called to be obedient. We're not called to be all-knowing. We're called to believe. We're not called to be victorious. We're called to be courageous. We're not called to lord it over others. We're called to serve others. For it's in serving that we shall reign. It's through courage that we shall find victory. It's in giving all that we shall find certainty. It's in obedience that we shall overcome. It's in loving that we shall find perfection. It's in slavery to Jesus Christ and his justice that we shall find freedom now and forever, for ourselves and for the world. And that's what a Protestant, that's what a Presbyterian is all about. Do you know where you stand? Are you willing to take a stand? I know where I stand. I take my stand here with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I challenge you to take the same stand, for even now, the ax is ready to cut down every tree that does not bear good fruit. They'll be cut down to the roots and thrown into the fire. So my friends, in this business, you better lead, follow, or get out of the way. Gracious God, 
May the words on my lips and the meditations in our hearts always be acceptable to you. Our, you are our rock and our redeemer in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us now stand and sing Martin Luther's favorite hymn. Let us remain standing as we dedicate our lives to God by reaffirming our faith using the brief statement of faith from 1983 when we Presbyterians went through a little reformation. Christians, what do you believe? In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God. Jesus was crucified, suffering the deaths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. 
God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. Before we take up our offering, let us pray. Gracious God, as Christ was offered in obedience to you, we offer ourselves and our gifts to be used in your service. And as you took Christ's sacrifice and filled it with your life and power, so use our gifts and transform our lives that we may be the living presence of your reign on earth, now and always. We pray in the strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us now return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. As we come to our prayer time together again, let us remember all those folks printed in our bulletin in the prayer chain at the back, and we need to keep those folks in our prayers every day and all week. Pray with me. Great God, you understand Scottish, German, French, Arabic, Spanish, Italian, Hindustani, English. You also understand corporate management tribal powwows, branches of government, and church polity. 
Look with wisdom and love upon all those gathered here today, O God. Comfort those who are sorrowful. Strengthen those who are fatigued. Enlighten those of us who are inquiring and save any of us who are lost. Empower us with your Holy Spirit as we come to worship. Lord, you know how we get depressed over the church. It seems too man-made sometimes. Priority is given to the peripheral. We keep hearing about retooling and restructuring. Organization is always being reorganized. Lord, we have a feeling that the organized church bears little resemblance to the body given birth by your Spirit. Meetings seem to major in minor matters. Hope seems to be anchored in new structures. Leadership seems oriented to secular success symbols. It seems strange, Lord, to be praying for the church like that. I mean, if the church is your body, why should we ever despair over her failings or faults? Is it, Lord, that you are calling us to reform? Do you keep prodding us to get out of the trap of perfecting structure to the task of perfecting people? Are you leading us away from organization and order to openness and opportunity? Lord, we get so wrapped up in trying to save the institution rather than the individual that in every generation we seem to need a reformation. We make the organized church our end rather than a means to the salvation and sanctification of people. But we do remember how individual voices led to reforms in the past. Bring reform in our time. Even if your spirit must blow down the structures that we've made sacred but which are roadblocks to your kingdom. You've blessed us richly here at First Presbyterian Church and we ask that we can continue to be a blessing to others as you have blessed us. You have a plan for this church or it would not be here. We do need to discern what the future holds. So we boldly ask you to guide us into the future no matter where it takes us. We lift up to you those who are suffering in body, in mind, in spirit, and need your healing touch. All those printed in the bulletin, all those on our minds. We lift up to you those who are lonely, who are anxious, who are isolated, and need your strong presence. We lift to you those who are searching and questioning, looking for direction and need your wisdom and guidance. We lift to you those who are dear to us on our, in our minds and in our hearts, and those we don't know, but are struggling with the disasters that the violence of nature has brought, the unfairness of systems that stifle, the burdens of responsibility that weigh folks down beyond their ability. For all of us, Lord, we lift these petitions and intercessions to you in the silence of our souls. Today we come to celebrate our heritage as your children. We have a rich diversity of families and cultures and we thank you for giving us so many colorful ethnic backgrounds represented here today. So we come to you, O oh Father, as your eternal children, lifting to you all of our thoughts and concerns and heartaches and joys, and we meld all these prayers, both verbal and silent, into the one great prayer your Son taught us when praying to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand to sing. is over but our service begins so may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may God give you grace never to sell yourself short grace to risk something big for something good and grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love so may God take your minds and think through them may God take your lips and speak through them May God take your hearts and set them on fire. 
And may God lift up his countenance upon you and give to you and those you love and those whom nobody loves his peace. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence, we pray in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.